Throughout the Civil War, Missouri officially remained neutral. However, the reality was much different. It was an open secret that the governor of Missouri was actively supporting the Confederate cause, even sending supplies and troops for the Confederate Army. After a series of early Confederate victories in Missouri, including the Battle of Wilson's Creek in August 1861, the political balance appeared to hang. Pressure in the North gave rise to a fresh campaign to expel the rebels. Early in 1862, Confederate forces under Van Dorn were slowly pushed back south and west through Missouri. Throughout early 1862, Union forces under Samuel Curtis, who was appointed by Halleck over the somewhat more popular Franz Siegel, pushed back Van Dorn south and west through Missouri. As the United States forces in Missouri in late 1861 and early 62 pushed back the Missouri State Guard under Sterling Price, command was given to Van Dorn. Curtis moved his 10,000 federal soldiers to try and flank Van Dorn. Van Dorn, in turn, tried risky maneuvers to cut off the Union supply lines at Bentonville, splitting his unit into two. As Curtis pushed the Missouri State Guard back into Arkansas, the battle lines were drawn around Pea Ridge, near Leeville, so that by early March, Van Dorn's forces were in two different parts of the ridge and vulnerable to attack. Today, on Tabletop History, we review the Battle of Pea Ridge. March 7, 1862 saw Price's division under Van Dorn the eastern side of what was known as Big Mountain. The rest of his command was still to the west of the mountain, split away from the rest of the Confederate forces. The Union command under Samuel Curtis found themselves run by a West Point graduate who most recently before the war served as a congressman from the state of Iowa. Military itself is not without politics, of course, and a political rival to Curtis was actually his second in command, Franz Siegel. Franz Siegel was a military officer, an immigrant to the United States, who did serve as a well-known general during the Civil War. His ability to speak to German troops in their own native language made him quite well liked among the soldiers. However, he was strongly disliked by early General-in-Chief Henry Halleck, who chose to appoint Curtis over him. To help keep the peace among the army itself, Curtis named Siegel the commander of the 1st and 2nd Divisions under his command. On the Confederate side, Earl Van Dorn was the commander of the Army of the West. A great nephew of Andrew Jackson, he fought with distinction during the Mexican-American War and was well known as a Western theater commander throughout the Civil War. One of Van Dorn's major generals was Sterling Price, who actually served as governor of Missouri in the 1850s. Initially a strong supporter of the Union, he actually backed Stephen Douglas for president in 1860 against Abraham Lincoln. When the Missouri State Convention was called to consider secession from the Union in 1861, Price was actually named the presiding officer of that state convention, which voted against leaving the Union. Although it officially remained, Missouri was definitely a pro-slavery state. Once Union soldiers took command in St. Louis and started overriding the state rights of Missouri, Sterling Price himself changed his mind and became a pro-Confederate supporter. Brigadier General Albert Pike was a Confederate general who was actually a Northern man, born in Boston, Massachusetts. Settling in Arkansas in the 1830s and 40s, he was well known as a journalist and lawyer in the area. When the Mexican-American War broke out, Pike joined a regiment of Arkansas Mounted Volunteers, the Cavalry Regiment. So when the Civil War came around, Pike was set as a Confederate envoy 
to actually Native American nations. With his historical relationship with Native American tribes, Pike was able to recruit several different regiments and even brigades of Native Americans who would fight for the Confederacy. His units in this battle were actually largely made up of Native American soldiers fighting for the Confederacy. As the Union lines were drawn, with most of the forces actually coming into the south along the Pea Ridge into Lee Town, Confederate forces were split. This proved to be an important decision as cold rains swept through in early March weather. The Confederates outnumbered the Union by quite a bit. However, we're dealing with state militia on the Confederate side attacking regulars. While outnumbered, they were well supplied, and the Union actually held the advantage despite the numbers here, particularly when given the splitting up of the different divisions between the Confederate lines. The bulk of the Confederate army struck from the northeast early that morning. Carr's division, with Dodge's brigade in particular taking the brunt of it, was pushed back. However, the battle was able to be stalled as Van Dever was able to come up and support. Their combined brigades were able to hold back against the Missouri State Guard, who was pushing along the Pea Ridge. The large mountain proved to be impassable for any sizable army. So pinned between the Army of the Union and the Big Mountain, Confederate attacks were limited in the scope of what they could do. On the Western Front, McCullough brought his brigade, with Pike in particular and McIntosh cavalry brigades against Siegel's 1st and 2nd Divisions under Osterhaus and Davis. Holding their ground around the Elkhorn Tavern, the Union forces on the eastern side of this battle were able to hold their ground. Fighting waged back and forth throughout most of the morning, while the Union slowly gave up their positions along the different lines. By 12.30 in the afternoon, Vandever had arrived at Elkhorn Tavern. This immediately launched a counterattack by the Union forces, who were able to hold their ground much more securely. While the pincer movement by the Confederates was stalled for a time, there was a definite back and forth, and it wasn't until 2 p.m. that Van Dorn found out that McCulloch's division would not be meeting the Confederate forces at Elkhorn, instead engaged with Union forces of their own around Lee Town, some distance to the west. McCulloch's forces in the western side of the battle consisted largely of cavalry brigades under McIntosh and Pike. At around 11.30 a.m., Osterhaus rode north through the timber of the foster farm and witnessed an astonishing sight. Not expecting to find Confederates that far to the west, the Union engaged with them holding up their advance. Using Lee Town and the forest surrounding it as cover, the Union was able to push back. One major notable part about this battle is that McCullough himself was killed in the fighting. Benjamin McCullough, a native of Texas, was a Texas Ranger and took part in the Texas Revolution and rise to the rank of Major General in the Texas Militia. Throughout much of his life, he was a fighter for Texas and was part of the war with Mexico. When Texas seceded, he went with it, and he perished at Pea Ridge, Arkansas. With the death of McCullough, most of the rest of the forces on the western side collapsed. The Confederates were pushed back, leaving Siegel's two divisions able to assist with the battle on the eastern side around Elkhorn Tavern. On day two, Siegel's position was in place. He was able to swing around with his brigades to take apart the right flank of the Confederate lines. Throughout the morning, Confederates were pushed back and eventually broke, heading back to the north and east. The Union defenses, the division of the Confederate Army, the poor supplies, and much more proved to be just too much for the Confederates. Separated from their supply train, Van Dorn's main body retreated through the sparsely settled country for a week living off of what little food they could find from nearby farmers. They finally reunited with their supply train, 
but thousands of their troops deserted and returned back to Missouri. The army was essentially destroyed after this, and Missouri itself would never again be under threat for secession. It stayed in Union hands for the remainder of the war. As such, the Union was able to divert many resources that were devoted to the far west to help push against the oncoming Confederate attacks to secure the center heart of the Confederacy. Pea Ridge National Military Park, which was founded in the 1950s, is one of the best preserved Civil War battlefields. A reconstruction of the Elkhorn Tavern, which was the scene of the heaviest fighting, stands in the original location. The park also recognizes the Trail of Tears. Our players will be reenacting the Battle of Pea Ridge, also sometimes known as Elkhorn Tavern. With the Union side under Brigadier General Samuel Curtis and Fran Siegel, there will be four divisions at their disposal. Included with this will be an unattached cavalry unit that they can decide to use however they want. Standing against them will be the Confederate command under Earl Van Dorn. With McCullough's division and Price's division, as well as the Missouri State Guard, we will see them deployed, split, as they were historically. How the battle plays out, we will have to see, so we hope you join us next time as we begin to reenact our battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas on Tabletop History.